So have you heard about the atheist, the Muslim, the Christian, and the Jew? They walk into a bar and the bartender says, is this a joke? <laughs> well, these days, religion is no joke. In fact, if there is a joke, it appears to be that the joke is on us. For thousands of years, religion was not held to be funny. But as secular life progressed, and especially, I think, in the last 50 years, it's become possible, at least in the West, to satirize religion, to expose its various foibles, and perhaps even worse. This, of course, has led to a fairly furious counterattack by religious zealots on the other side, and so the battle is joined. Uh, we're going to put the cat in among the pigeons by calling up on stage Professor Richard Dawkins. Uh, in the last year, Richard has invigorated and pretty well dominated this uh, worldwide debate about religion. His book, The God Delusion, has been a worldwide bestseller, a publishing phenomenon, and I want to thank his publisher and his publicist, Lisa Zaritsky, for getting Professor Richard Dawkins up on stage here at Idea City 07. Thank you, Richard. Shortly before I left for Canada, the chief rabbi of the Commonwealth, Sir Jonathan Sachs, uh, wrote an article in the Times of London, which I thought was a very broad-minded and uh, rather moving article. He mentioned a series of books by atheists, uh, among them mine, and uh, he attributed the motivation for writing these books to a feeling that religion was manifestly a source of a certain amount of evil in the world. And I quote, Sunni and Shia fight in the Middle East, as do Muslim and Hindu in Kashmir, Buddhists and Hindus in Sri Lanka, Muslims and Jews in Israel. Religions still do not know how to live together in peace. That's when people start writing books about atheism, and they become bestsellers. As I said, he thought the reason for this spate of a atheistic books was a reaction against um, the warlike consequences of religion. And that may be true for some of my colleagues, but it's not what I want to talk about today. I am interested in the simple question of whether religious beliefs are actually true. I want to argue that on a, on a matter of probability, it's extremely unlikely that any kind of supernatural creative intelligence exists. The argument I'm going to use is a kind of inverse of the argument from design. Living things are highly complicated, they're elegant, they're beautiful, they're highly improbable statistically. They couldn't come about by chance. The more complicated a, a living thing is, the less likely it is to come about by sheer luck. Therefore, God must have done it. That's how the argument goes. Fred Hoyle expressed it in his famous misunderstanding of natural selection, the great Boeing 747 example. He said um, to, to believe that life could be formed uh, by Darwinian processes is equivalent to believing that a hurricane could blow through a junkyard and have the luck to assemble a Boeing 747. And that is a, an eloquent statement of the great creationist misunderstanding which is that Darwinian evolution is a matter of chance. Of course, it isn't. It's a matter of gradual, cumulative natural selection. And the stress is on the word cumulative. Because it's cumulative, you have a slow, steady, incremental climb up the, s the gentle slopes of Mount Improbable. And at the top of Mount Improbable, you have a very improbable, complicated, beautiful, elegant, biological structure, the biological equivalent of a Boeing 747. The essence of the argument that I want to put is that God himself would have to be a fortiori, even more complicated and improbable an entity if he is to do what is expected of him, 
which is to create life or to create the universe, let alone listen to prayers and forgive sins. The essence of my argument is that God is the ultimate Boeing 747, and that any attempt to deploy the argument from improbability, which is actually the main argument that any theist uses in favor of theism, any attempt to deploy the argument from improbability backfires, shoots itself in the foot, because it can be turned on itself, it can be turned on God. Now, the Darwinian theory works beautifully once life gets started, but there may be a gap at the beginning which gives people problems. What about the origin of life? What about that first step that kick-starts the evolutionary process? Chemists are working on it. It's a, it's a chemical problem. It's a matter for chemists. Chemists are working on it, and um, obviously it's very hard to do because it happened a long time ago under very different conditions, and so um, all we can hope for is some kind of plausibility argument backed up by theoretical models. There are a billion, billion galaxies and a plausible number of planets. Think of the implications of that. The fact that there are so many planets in the universe, so many, more, more generally, so many opportunities for life to have originated, entitles us, if we need it, to postulate a theory of the origin of life which is just vanishingly, ludicrously improbable by the standards of human judgment of improbability. If the probability of life arising in the entire universe is so low that only one planet in the entire universe has life, that is an entirely plausible theory of the origin of life because by the anthropic principle, since we're here, the one planet which has life has to be this one. We are entitled to postulate a theory of the origin of life which is so improbable, so unlikely, that it only gives rise to life on one planet in the entire universe. Now, I must stress, I don't think for one moment that life is as improbable as that. In other words, what I'm saying is that I think that there are islands of life dotted around the galaxy, dotted around the universe. Having said that, I must hasten to say that you cannot use that kind of logic to account for all the rich panoply of life as we know it. We have um, many millions of maybe 10 million species. And each one of those 10 million species, let alone all the ones that have gone extinct, each one of those 10 million species is making its living by detailed, exact, precisely engineered fits of animal or plant to environment. You cannot use the anthropic principle. You cannot use the, the improbability argument that I've just used for the origin of life. You cannot use that argument to account for all the species of life on Earth. You have to have something else, and that something else, of course, is evolution by natural selection. The reason you can't use the anthropic principle is that there are so many different species. They're all doing it. They're all doing it in parallel. We have here an ongoing process, an ongoing process of um, highly adapted fit between organism and environment. So you see what I'm moving towards, a combination of the anthropic principle, if we require it to account for the origin of life, plus natural selection, which is very much not the anthropic principle, plus natural selection to account for the detailed um, engineering of the, good, the goodness of fit of living things to the environment. Many physicists would accept that the fundamental constants of the universe could be regarded as fine-tuned. It looks as though we've got six knobs, six dials that you can twiddle. And it's as though somebody's come along and twiddled these six dials so that they're exactly the right value. If they were a tiny bit wrong, um, maybe there'd be nothing but hydrogen in the universe, and so you couldn't have chemistry. Or maybe there would be no hydrogen in the universe, so again, you couldn't have at least the sort of chemistry that, um, that gives rise to life. How do we handle this fine-tuning problem? Well, the God solution might occur to you. Um, maybe it was God who twiddled the knobs. Maybe it was God who fine-tuned the constants. As I've pointed out, that won't do because we are left with the question, who fine-tuned God in the first place? There are other physicists, or there are physicists, who think there's not a problem at all, who would say something like, well, it's only our ignorance that makes us think that these six knobs are twiddleable. Maybe there's only one possible way for them to be. Maybe they're not independent of each other. Maybe they're sort of ganged up together in some way that if you twiddle one, they all go or something of that sort. 
And so those are the physicists who say, well, we, we, we don't yet know enough. We're waiting for further knowledge, and when we have it, we'll understand. Then there's a third group of physicists, which um, are, are the ones that, um, that, with my limited understanding of physics, this is the one that appeals to me more. Maybe there are lots of different universes, uh, and they all have different fundamental constants, slightly different from, from, each, from each other, and it may be that the vast majority of them have their knobs twiddled into the wrong position. But only a, t a tiny minority have the knobs twiddled into the right position. And once again, the anthropic principle kicks in and says, of all those billions of different universes, a foam, a bubbled foam of universes, which have different laws and constants, it has to be one of the tiny minority that contains our universe, that, 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 that is our universe, because, again, using the anthropic principle, here we are. So I'm building up a picture of uh, the anthropic principle on two different levels. Universe, planets, and then natural selection takes over. Now, I just want to finish by saying that this seems to me to be a very, very convincing and coherent and actually beautiful and elegant account of the origin of everything that we know. And elegance is, is what I would stress. The, the idea that something that you don't understand, you immediately say, oh, God did it, is uh, not only logically flawed, but actually aesthetically offensive. I mean uh, offensive in the sense that it's, it, it, it subtracts from the beauty and the elegance of science, where we've got this wonderful theory for life, to then have to jettison all that and throw it away, having explained the origin of complexity and the beauty of life, to then say, oh, God did it. Because things like God, things that, that are, are complicated and capable of designing anything, have to come about by some explicable process. They come about late in the universe, not, um, not early. I've got to stop. Thank you very much.